and it's about it's 131 now we have 46 people in attendance Sarah Linda so okay yeah I think the um I don't see anybody in the waiting room oh. um except for one person whom I'm <laughs> I'm just going to admit and another one let's see if anybody else is coming into the waiting room we'll give it till 132 and and then we'll then we will start um a beautiful sunny day very cold um so welcome to the warmth of um our virtual docent tour of glenview's greatest hits Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Sarah Linda Licklow and I'm Director of Education here at the Hudson River Museum. And um, again, I would like to welcome you uh, to this really first of our virtual team tour um, conducted by our wonderful docents um, who work with us at the Hudson River Museum and lend their enthusiasm and their knowledge to everything that we do together. Um, in putting this, this tour together, we were thinking about what, you know, what do people want to know about Glenview? Glenview, which is really the centerpiece of the museum's collection, where the museum started. And um, docents are, are gonna discuss what you, the visitors, uh, are particularly interested in and dig into those questions, especially questions um, that people ask about the family, who lived there? Um, what did they own? What are the objects uh, that are original to the house that um, would reflect life of a family in the Victorian age and especially the Trevor family of which you will learn a lot in the next hour. So um, they'll also explore what continues to inspire them about Glenview. Um, they keep coming back and adding insight into their tours um, every time it is given. And a lot of that is because of the, um, the interaction between docents and visitors. So we welcome your visitors, um, our visitors, and I want to just tell you our wonderful docents uh, whom you will meet in a few minutes. We have Spencer, David, Carolyn, Hal, Richard, Marietta, Kathy, and Susan. And to introduce them in a little more detail, we have Bridget McCormick, who is the manager of school programs and who works very closely with the docents to produce these tours for your enjoyment. So Bridget. Thanks, Sarah Linda. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. We're, we're glad to have a, a big crowd. And um, I just want to note the, the plans for today's tour. So in a moment, what's going to happen is um, the docents are each going to take you through the rooms of Glenview. Um, we have a great story to tell you. And what we hope to do because of the size of this um, crowd um, is to hold off any questions until the end of the presentation. In the meantime, please use the chat function to note any questions you have as, as we go through the house, but um, we have so much to share that we wanna make sure we get through it. And we hope you can stay afterwards as we address those questions. Um, my final note is uh, please keep yourselves muted um, until the end of the presentation when we have that Q&A session. But otherwise, um, we're really glad you're here and um, uh, on that note, I think we are ready to begin, and I'm going to turn, turn it over to Marietta. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Glenview at the Hudson River Museum. My name is Marietta, and I'm a docent here, someone who leads tours. This is the story of a family home in Yonkers, a river home with a past. Glenview, as it was named, was built by John Bond Trevor a Wall Street banker, a successful stockbroker, a presidential elector, and later a Republican Party representative. He was born in Philadelphia in 1822, moved to New York when he was 27 years old, and like many other businessmen of the 19th century, he preferred to live in safety and comfort in the newly accessible suburbs of New York City, the village of Yonkers. He could then commute to work 
on the train each day. First slide, please. People often ask me why he chose to build in Yonkers and to live in Yonkers. Close up, please. New York City during the 1860s and 70s post-Civil War was noisy, crowded, and chaotic. A national capital for tourism and entertainment. Grand hotels, museums, prostitution, nightclubs, gambling, factories, slaughterhouses, very smelly slaughterhouses, corruption and graft from politicians, and a massive influx of immigrants fleeing from Europe, looking for a better life. Landing in the Southwest Battery, later called Clinton Castle, all contributed to this chaos. There was social upheaval, old world criminal societies, housing tenements and flimsy shacks to house the more desperate. I am not talking about 2021 now. I'm still going back to 1870. In 1874, 61% of all US exports passed through New York Harbor, a bustling port. There were epidemics, typhus, cholera, diphtheria, yellow fever, measles of all things, tuberculosis, water quality and sanitation were questionable. Horse manure covered the streets as did dead animals and worse. Some of the problems have improved in 2021. There is no horse manure on the streets that I am aware of. John Bon Trevor saw all of this daily as he worked on Wall Street and longed for a better and safer life for his future family. Next slide, please. This is a beautiful autumn day in Hastings on Hudson, a suburb uh, not too far from Glenview. This was painted by Jasper Cropsey. Air, light, plants, the river, the palisades, Land like this, safe and beautiful, was desired and affordable to John Bon Trevor and his future family. In 1861, he took his new bride, Louisa Stewart Trevor, to the suburban village of Yonkers and purchased a modest home on Ravine Avenue near his friend and partner, James B. Colgate. Louisa died in 1867, only two years after giving birth to their son, Henry. Slide three, please. This is Glenview. Mr. Trevor remarried in 1870 to Emily Norwood. He subsequently purchased 23 acres for a reportedly $150,000 3.3 million in today's money. This land was north of their present home, but very near it, near the Hudson River. Mr. Trevor engaged an architect, Charles W. Clinton, to design Glenview and begin to construct his forever home in the spring of 1876. Watching it being built must have been very exciting and rewarding for the family. It was completed in the autumn of 1877, only over a short period of a year and a few months, at a cost of 80 to $100,000, approximately 2 million in today's money. Slide next, next slide, please. This is our family. Mr. Trevor entered his newly built suburban manor with his second wife, Emily Norwood Trevor, and his first son, Henry, now 11 years old. He had two daughters by this time, Mary six and Emily three. His second son, John, would be born in 1878. That's uh, when John was just a little older and when Henry was just a little older than that. This family then continued with their many servants, drivers, gardeners, and nannies to live in the community for the next 46 years 
contributing to the success and growth of suburban Yonkers. Thank you. Our next docent, David, will present details about the architectural style and the elements of this grand home. David? Thanks, Marietta. Uh, you teed that up really beautifully. But well, thank um, you. So, so um, Charles W. Clinton, uh, the architect, is best known for the 7th Regiment Armory, uh, also known as the Park Avenue Armory, the one in New York City. Uh, Clinton began his career with Richard Upjohn, who popularized Gothic Revival by building churches all over the Eastern US. The most famous one is Trinity Church in Manhattan. The exterior of the house was designed in the height of an eclectic fashion, so it features elements of a number of different styles. Elements of Victorian Gothic and French Second Empire design prevail. The facade is boldly asymmetrical. Looking at this house, I would not have normally said uh, Gothic, because to me, Gothic means pointy arched windows and something that looks like a church, something that looks like Trinity Church in, in New York. Uh, but I consulted my handy dandy field guide to American houses by Virginia and Lee McAllister for confirmation. Um, and it does show similar houses in what, what we would call Victorian Gothic style. Um, so if you think about something like the Brooklyn Bridge or uh, the Lyndhurst mansion up in uh, Irvington, uh, that would, those would also be Victorian Gothic. And then the second empire comes into play when you look at the roof line. So you've got the, the, uh, the roof that actually covers an entire story of the house that is a typical uh, sec French second empire uh, device. Uh, we would also call this a centennial house because a lot of what was done in this house was seen and purchased at the centennial in Phil Philadelphia in, in 1876. So the gray stone facade of the house was constructed by blocks hewn from a Hudson, Hastings on Hudson Quarry. Uh, Hastings is uh, for you, those of you who are not from, uh, from New York uh, suburbs, that's right north of Yonkers. Uh, and the quarry was, uh, if anybody knows the area, about a block north of the Farragut Parkway at the intersection of Rosedale and Ravensdale. Uh, and it was sometimes referred to as Munson's Quarry. Uh, or Nichols Quarry, and the quarry itself operated into early into the 20th century. Uh, if you knew what you were looking for, you could go there and you could see where the quarry was. There are houses built on top of it, but uh, it was it's pretty clear when you know what you're looking for that there was there was stone quarry there. The quarry is not the one that a lot of people know that is right off of the old Croton Aqueduct. That was a marble quarry, and um, that marble was of very high quality. Marble Collegiate Church, also in New York City, was, uh, was made from the marble in Hastings. Uh, the stone itself is uh, Fordham nice, and it's a rough blue-gray st uh, stone. Um, some people might call it granite. We always wonder when we're uh, talking about the house, how they got it from Hastings to Yonkers. And it's likely that it was uh, ferried or barged down the, down the Hudson. I know that the quarry, uh, the marble quarry had a little railway running from it that went right to the waterfront so they could put the, put the stones on barges and bring them down. Um, there are decorative sandstone lintels over the windows and strong courses and they're either from Indiana or Ohio. Our, our records list both. Uh, the last time I gave a tour, somebody wanted to know if the windows were original. And all we have to do is look at that painting from when the house was built to see that yes, all the window, uh, windows are in their original frames. And there's probably a lot of original glass in the house as well. The mansard style roof was finished with colorful slate tiles. Uh, we don't call those shingles. Apparently, sh proper shingles are made out of wood. Uh, and they were originally red, ochre, and gray, but they're still polychromed or multicolored shingles in a decorative pattern on the, on the uh, south side of the house uh, as they were originally. At the roof line is an overhanging cornice with dentals and voluted, meaning scrolled brackets all the way around the roof line. The observation tower is a whole 84 feet tall. Uh, there were porches on uh, the southeast corner of the house uh, uh, connected to a port cochere, which is a, a, little, uh, a little porch 
that your carriage drives up and under so people can get out of their carriages and in the bad weather and not be affected. Uh, so those are gone, but there's the, they were similar in style to the, the smaller porch that's in front of the front door. And one of the best features of the house was the veranda, which once ran the entire length of the west side of the house. And that was removed eventually when, they, when the house became a museum. Uh, the house was built by local tradesmen and they were under the supervision of a Yonkers builder named S.F. Quick. And Glenview's exterior was more than matched by its stately interior scheme, which we'll, you'll hear about from everybody else. Uh, next slide. Uh, the house had about 29 rooms. It's a little difficult to, to tell because we're not sure what's considered a room. That's a hall, a room, we don't know. Uh, next slide. And there were five bedrooms on the second floor and about nine were on the third floor. They were primarily for the servants, but the children might've lived up there at the same time to be close to their nannies. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, that is the greenhouse. Uh, and John Bond Trevor had always been interested in horticulture. He spent hours and hours planting the Glenview grounds. He brought in trees like maple, copper beech, oriental pine, and ginkgo, and had them planted in attractive arrangements. Some of those trees are still on the property. Trevor built a small gardener's cottage of clapboard, and it was designed in the East Lake style that you'll hear a lot of, about later. And it was near the entrance to the estate and close to the greenhouses where he himself cultivated his gold and red Glenview chrysanthemums. Apparently the chrysanthemums were popular, popular enough that you could purchase them in the city. The Gothic style of that greenhouse is evident in the roof line. Uh, there were also stables on the property. The gates to the estate were south on the drive to the train station, which was a couple blocks south of the one that we have right now. You can still see the stone pillars at the southern end of Trevor Park. Uh, next is the interior of the greenhouse, uh, where, where fresh flowers and food could be acquired throughout the year. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, inside and outside of the house, you'll see a repeated flower motif in the car form of a carved rosette. There's an internal debate at the, at the museum as to whether or not this was intended to be a chrysanthemum or a sunflower. Both chrysanthemums and sunflowers had significant meaning to the Victorians, and they would have to the Trevor family. I like to think of it as a Glenview mom. Now, my friend and associate Hal will take you into the front door of the home. Next slide, please. So, let's see if there's anybody home. If we were coming to visit the Trevors, we would enter through this vestibule. Next slide, please. And into the Great Hall. Next slide again. We would be greeted by the head servant of the house, not a butler. Even though the Trevors had around 17 servants, there was no record of a butler. Their servants were mostly Irish women and they were all called by the same name, Bridget. So the head Bridget would take your card, offer, offer us a seat and retire upstairs to see if Mrs. Trevor wanted to receive us. While we wait, we have the time to be impressed by this magnificent hall, which was designed for just that purpose, to impress. The black walnut wainscoting Timbered ceiling and large fireplace are reminiscent of medieval halls. The interior of Glenview was influenced by Charles Eastlake, who introduced the arts and crafts or aesthetic movement to America. The first thing to marvel over is the floor tile, both in the vestibule and the length of the hall. This is encaustic tile from the Maw and Company in England. And caustic tile has the color imbued throughout, not only on the surface. This tile is over 150 years old, has been walked on by thousands of people and is still in perfect condition. The encaustic technique has an interesting history. It was developed during the Middle Ages by English monks when Henry VIII closed the monasteries in the 16th century, the technique was lost. It was not until 1828 that Herbert Minton 
of mint and tile tried to recreate it. It took him 12 years. By the latter part of the century, several com com companies had adopted the technique. And here, though our tile is from Minton, not is from Maw, not Minton, we can see the fruit of his labor. You may be wondering about the portrait of this handsome lady. Who is she? Is she a member of the, of the Trevor family? Actually, no. This is Eva Cochran, who with her husband owned, who, who you'll meet later, owned the Alexander Smith Carpet Company, one of the most important businesses in Yonkers and one of its largest employers. She was painted by Theobald Chatron in 1905. We always have to be careful around Eva. She always is watching. Wherever you go in sight of her portrait, her eyes follow you. It has been said that she is looking for her husband, who I believe is hiding in another part of the house. Several of the portraits now hung in Glenview are of important businesses, political or social leaders of the town during the time the Trevors lived there. Our eyes would naturally be attracted to the fireplace and the surround at the far end of the hall. Next slide, please. We may wonder why the fireplace looks unused. Well, it never was used. While there are other working fireplaces throughout the house, this one is purely decorative. In the center is Guinevere, wife of King Arthur. Beneath her, a quote from Tennyson's Idols of the King. Along the top, tiles representing various fairy tales, which were probably used to entertain and teach the children. But the main attraction is the center grand staircase, which dominates the hall. This stairway was built by Daniel Pabst, one of the finest cabinet makers and wood carvers of the Gilded Age. You will notice the flower carved into the newel post. As was stated earlier, we are not sure what this flower represented, but I prefer sunflower. I can't spell chrysanthemum. The original brass light fixture, next, next slide, please. Lit with gas, as did all the chandeliers in the house. If you, ever had, if you have ever spent time in a gas lit house, you will know how great the light makes you look. Now the only question is whether Mrs. Trevor will receive us. But as we are honored guests, I'm sure she will. Next slide, please. And there she is. Well, not really. That is actually Mrs. Samuel Untemeyer, who lived just up the hill. She was one of the leaders of Gilded Age Yonkers Society. This portrait of the great lady was done in 1906 by James Shannon, who during the 19th century was considered on par with John's, John Singer Sargent. As we admire this excellent painting, we will probably be attracted to the lovely ley light directly above the stairway. Next slide, please. A ley light differs from a skylight in that it is not directly open to the sky, but lit by, protective, by a protective skylight over it. The ley light was covered up at some point and was out of view for 30 years before it was discovered as part of Glenview's restoration. Next slide, please. But we can imagine Mrs. Trevor standing there in one of the four or five outfits she would wear each day. Hey, when you have 17 servants, you have plenty of time to change her clothes. And down she comes to greet us and to welcome us into her home. Carolyn, where do you think she would take us next? I'd say let's turn right and go into the parlor. 
Today, I hope you're all dressed up formally because the parlor is the most elegant, sophisticated, and formal room in the house. So just look at it for a couple of seconds, take it in. The parlor was on cutting edge of fashion. It's a perfect example of the aesthetic movement that was catching on in Britain and in America. The movement attempted to dismantle the fussy, conservative Victorian traditions. Instead, it embraces geometric lines, simplified forms, and a subdued palette, all working together to create one unified whole. Another goal of the movement was to create art for art's sake and to reject machine made in favor of quality craftsmanship. Of course, that's a lot easier to do if you're rich and you have the money who can afford to uh, afford handmade furnishings. Now, it may look overdone to our eyes today, this room and the other rooms in Glenview, but in fact, it is very much restrained compared to what the interiors of homes look like 20 years before. In fact, the Glenview parlor was designed as a whole. Beautiful, handcrafted, but it's still functional. The wallpaper, the ceiling stencils, the textiles, the whole thing creates a rich layering of pattern upon pattern. So let's move on to the next slide. We're looking at a detail of the ceiling. When you step into this room, you see a stunning harm harmony, basically a symphony of blues and greens and creams and gold. There's quite a bit of gold because it is the Gilded Age. This effect was the work of many craftsmen. The ceiling was hand stenciled and hand painted. The fireplace was carved just for the room. I don't understand, whenever I go into this room, it, it confounds me. Why don't the rich adorn their ceilings anymore? The stenciled ceilings of Glenview are one of its most beautiful features. They feature geometric forms intertwined, intertwined with abstract flowers and vines. So let's move on to the next slide. Hello. So when you look closer, you'll see there's a peacock, peacock stuffed, of course, standing in front of the fireplace. There's a lot of blues and greens going on here too, as, as well. It's all part of the ensemble, all part of the intent. Peacocks were popular in the Gilded Age. They're showy, they're rare, they're far from ordinary. They make a big statement, just like the homes of the wealthy. Let's move on to the next slide. So what was the parlor used for? It was for important events. So we see Mary Trevor on the right with her teeny tiny waist. And on the left, we see her and Grenville Winthrop, her husband. And by the way, that portrait of Grenville is from his Harvard yearbook. Apparently they actually had yearbooks in the 1890s. So Mary's wedding reception which was in 1892, took place in the parlor. They had a chartered train that left from Grand Central Depot, that's what it was called in the 1890s, not Grand Central Terminal. When people received their invitations, they also received passes to ride on this train. It must have been a lot of fun, actually. Now, Mary died when she was 29 and she left two girls behind. It was a major family tragedy. So her wake was in this parlor less than 10 years after her wedding. So let's move on to the next side and away from the sad story. Because the parlor was used for other things too. It was a place for the family to entertain themselves and their friends with music. Emily played the piano and the organ. This organ is not original to the house, but it is, it is of the period, and it's a player organ, something I never heard of before I became a docent at the museum. 
let's move on to the next slide and take another look at the parlor. So people often ask me, why are those chairs so low to the ground? And you can probably guess at least one good reason. Yes, people were actually quite a bit smaller than 150 years ago. So the chairs could be lower to the ground. But there's another reason. Women, particularly when they were all dressed up, which I hope they were when they're sitting in the parlor, there were layers of clothing that was restrictive to movement, big skirts, corsets. So these chairs could be sat in gracefully and without pain. Now, why is it called a parlor and why don't we use that term anymore? The room was used for conversation. It comes from parler, P-A-R-L-E-R, -E which in French means to talk. The term fell out of favor and now we all have our living rooms, which in most of our houses are still the most formal room in the house. So let's go to the next slide and take a look at the Patrician, Patrician Mother. This painting hangs in the same exact spot where the Trevors hung it when they bought it in 1876. It's by a woman actually, Anna Merritt. And that's quite forwarding, quite forward thinking on the part of the Trevors, particularly because they gave it a major prominent spot in their fanciest room. They'd seen it at the Philadelphia Centennial, which David had already mentioned. It was kind of a world's fair where well-off Americans were exposed to reddish facet um, decorating trends, and they were also introduced to Asian art and aesthetics. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, the Trevors didn't just travel domestically. We've got Emily on the left, the mother, and Emily on the right, her daughter. They went on the grand tour at least a couple times and indulged in the shopping spree buying Meissen figurines in Germany. Let's take a look at one. Here is Apollo. Oh, by the way, you can really see the wallpaper behind him. Um, here's Apollo in his chariot. Greek mythology was really quite popular in the Gilded Age. All those naughty gods misbehaving must have appealed to the seemingly straight-laced upper crust. So these mice and porcelains were very expensive and they were popular obviously only among the upper classes. So when a wealthy class emerged in America in the 19th century, they all decided they should start buying it too. The Vanderbilts have a lot of them and the Trevors have quite a few as well. So I just wanna remind everyone or tell everyone that the four Trevor children don't just stay in, didn't just stay inside. They were actually quite outdoorsy. Emily biked, she skated, she golfed, and she was one of the first female members of the Arts League Tennis Club. And then the boys, Henry and John, they sailed, they golfed too, and they were into trotting horses, just like their dad. So please remember that the guests could not call ahead to say that they were running late. The phone was invented the same year Glenview was built, 1876. So thank goodness for all those servers that Hal, Hal mentioned. Thank God they were around because there were, um, there were plenty of them to keep the food warm and the drinks passed while all the visitors, visitors arrived. Leave the parlor, it's time to eat. Kathy, will you take everyone into the dining room? Certainly. Oh, look, Ava Cochran's husband, William Francis Cochran, owner of the Alexander Smith Carpet Company, is hiding out in the dining room over the sideboard. Is he following us too? Or perhaps hiding out from his wife? The dining room is linked to the Great Hall through a similar use of black walnut wainscoting and timbered ceiling that Hal had mentioned. Carolyn pointed out the magnificent wallpaper in the parlor. It turns out that the parlor and this room seem to have been the only two wallpapered rooms in the Trevor home. A 1930 photograph and several small recovered fragments of the original wallpaper 
give us clues about the original wallpaper and could facilitate wallpaper restoration someday. By the middle of the 19th century, most upper class homes contained a dining room for both family use and entertaining guests. It's doubtful the children would have been allowed to dine with the adults on any but the most special of occasions. Surely they ate before the adults did, but where? Perhaps in the nursery upstairs, or maybe even in the billiard room. Next slide, please. Displays of Wedgwood china, crystal, and king silver showcase their wealth and success. The Trevor's china and 36 place settings of silverware came from Tiffany's. Their dining table would have seated around 18 people. This current mahogany table on long-term loan from the Metropolitan Museum is much smaller than the one the Trevor's used. Next slide, please. A typical Trevor breakfast might include offerings of oatmeal, fruit, muffins, codfish, broiled steak, boiled eggs, radishes, cookies, and coffee. A late afternoon dinner consisted of an overly abundant number of courses and a different wine pairing with each course. A typical menu might have included clam stew, roast lamb with mint sauce, new potatoes, sliced turnips, asparagus on toast, lettuce, onions, strawberry cream, snow custard macaroons and coffee. A lighter evening menu could have included fried calf's brain, jellied or boiled tongue, mm, my favorite, toasted kidney, and English trifle or tapioca pudding for dessert. Mrs. Trevor planned these menus with her cook and it was generally not expected that everyone would sample every dish, but rather treat the offerings as you would in a restaurant today. Fortunately, the Trevors employed over the years any time from 11 to 17 mostly Irish servants, not including the gardeners. Many of them would have been engaged in preparing, serving, and cleaning up from these elaborate meals. Countless hours must have been spent polishing up all that silver. Next slide, please. Mr. Prevert prided himself on the greenhouses of flowers and vegetables and his peach, apple, nectarine, and lemon trees. The family could enjoy fresh fruits and vegetables practically year round and meat from their cattle as well. French baked goods were also in vogue and often served for lunch. Next slide, please. Please take a moment to look up at the ceiling and the dining room chandelier. The chandelier is very close in style to the original and of course would have been lit by gas, not electricity at the time as it would have been more flattering for their faces and for the look of the dining room as well. And now you can really see the timbered look where they have the recessed panels and then the timbers dividing the ceiling into various geometric shapes. Next slide, please. One of the most interesting pieces of furniture in the dining room is the original sideboard made by the premier cabinet maker Hal told you about, Daniel Pabst. The Hudson River Museum has the largest collection of his work anywhere. Hal also mentioned the story tiles in the Great Hall fireplace. The fable theme is carried out in the sideboard as well. Next slide, please. The carvings in the doors represent the Aesop fable of the fox and the crane. Paps based the carving on a curtain design in Charles Eastlake's Hints on Household Taste. Spencer will share more about his book shortly. As you may recall, one day, the fox invited his friend, the crane, for dinner, and he deliberately served the crane soup in a flat plate that was impossible for the long beak of the crane to access. A short time later, the crane taught the fox a lesson and invited the fox to dinner. The crane served the soup in a tall vase-like vessel that was far too tall and narrow for the fox to put his tongue into. The moral of the story was about proper hospitality and prioritizing your guests' needs and tastes over your own. Next slide, please. The walnut folding screen with tapestry panels is original to the house and was strategically located to hide the meal preparation activities. The doorway hidden by the screen led to the butler's pantry and beyond that was the kitchen. A kitchen on the main floor was an unusual location at the time. Most front kitchens were located in the basement. After such an elaborate meal, 
the men and women would have retired separately to the ebony library and ladies' sitting room. If you peek through the pocket doors, you'll see Spencer waiting for you in the next room and ready to share more about Charles Eastlake with you. So these are the pocket doors. Uh, they are hidden in the wall. You don't, don't see them at the, they will slide across. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so the entry to the dining room is on the right. A servant will pull the pocket door across so that we are not disturbed by the sound of the servants clearing the table. The gentleman will move on to the library, which we will see later. And this is the ladies' sitting room. Now, by now you're beginning to realize that each room here is itself a unified work of art with its own colors and patterns and themes. Uh, this one, of course, the theme is ladies, genteel, uh, light, feminine, especially the uh, windows on the end, which give out onto a magnificent view of the Hudson River. This is Glenview, after all. And you would see a view very similar to the one in the landscape painting that we saw at the beginning of the show. You can, in fact, in those days, it was possible to walk out through one of these doors and stand on the veranda. But let us suppose now that the ladies will be sitting inside here. They are admiring uh, the uh, character of this room. And it not only is this room, uh, as each of the room a work of art, but the entire ground floor is a unified work of art, all tied together by the style of the stenciled ceilings and by the woodwork. You'll we'll notice on the right uh, bookshelf, there's also one on the left. Let's take a closer look at this. The next slide. So this is made out of bird's eye maple, much lighter than the walnut, dark walnut that we've seen previously in keeping with the color scheme of the room. And you can see on the right, an example of the marquetry, exquisitely fine marquetry, once again with the geometrical but floral patterns done by the workshop of, guess who? Pabst, of course. The entire ground floor is done by Pabst. Pabst was another of the discoveries that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Trevor made at the 1876 Philadelphia Exposition. They admired his work and brought him in to do the entire ground floor, which took pretty much the whole year that the house was being built. So now the ladies have now admired this, and so now they sit down and talk. Let's have the next slide. So here's Mrs. Trevor sitting and talking with the ladies. And what do they talk about? Business, certainly not. Politics, of course not. Those are the provinces of the men. So they will talk about the social affairs of the nation, the neighborhood gossip. They'll talk about servants, difficulty of keeping good servants and chefs and so forth. And of course, they will talk about their children. Many of them will have had many children. And this was a constant concern. And particularly among so many ladies, some of the children will probably either be sick now or recently getting over being sick. Now, I'm old enough that when I was born, the only vaccination was smallpox. So I had the usual childhood diseases, mumps and measles and chicken pox. They were miserable but you survived them and they were worrisome to the mothers. But what they really worried about was the diseases of the city, typhus, typhoid, scarlet fever, whooping cough, yellow fever. These were mortal diseases. So Victorian child rearing, the main concern in Victorian child rearing was simply keeping them alive. And the Trevors were rather unusual in that all four of their children survived to adulthood. Now let us consider Mrs. Trevor, oh, and one thing also for entertainment, of course, they did not have the radio. They did not have a phonograph. Next slide, please. They did have a music box, a, a ingenious thing, which you turn the handle and it will go on for quite some time, uh, wound up uh, playing something that sounds rather like a tinkly harpsichord. And they had a number of different roles that you could put in. So you could enjoy uh, background music for quite some time. Okay, so now Mrs. Trevor alone. Again, she has a, a next slide. So one of the things she would be doing, she would maintain her social, social life at a writing desk. This is not the original, like uh, much of the furniture in this house that is on loan from museums, but very similar to what would have been here originally. And Mrs. Trevor kept up a lively correspondence, no telephone at the start. So you would write a letter and we get the response the next day or perhaps even that afternoon. This is also where she conducted her business. What was her business? Well, with 17 servants, she was in charge of a rather large household. So the chef would come in and she would discuss what meals to serve. Mr. Trevor would never deign to suggest 
anything to eat. That was entirely his wife's province to arrange the dinners. And she would meet at least once a day with the housekeeper. Uh, they would go over uh, appropriately the accounts. They would talk about who to hire or fire. The housekeeper would be distinguished by a bundle of keys, many, many keys. Uh, this writing desk would have a lock. All the bookcases we saw would have locks. The, the servants were poor. If one of them could manage to pilfer a book and sell it, that would be worth a week's wages at least. Next slide. So Mrs. Trevor uh, at leisure, this uh, recliner, uh, which I blow again to the floor as you've seen. This is one of the original chairs reupholstered in the original style. Or Mrs. Trevor would have read books, Victorian novels, long narrative poems, uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of the magazines were just beginning to be published for people like herself, like the Ladies Home Journal, as the uh, name implies. Uh, she would have seen her children here uh, probably once a day, the Victorian custom of the children's hour. When the children were young, they would be brought down by their nannies or governess They'd be with their mother and she would read to them and she would hear about their uh, childish affairs and so forth. And then they would go back upstairs. This was the ground floor for the children. Uh, would they go into the parlor? Uh, well, if there were guests, they might go in in their best uh, dress for five minutes to be shown off to the guests. The dining room? No, uh, until they were old enough to sit still for two hours and not say a word, they would not go in the dining room. The kitchen, and nobody in the family went into the kitchen. Nobody thought nobody had anything to do with going into the kitchen. So this was where they would go. Uh, and then the other 23 hours upstairs, except of course they would be going outside. Next slide. Uh, uh, oh, I should, I should have had this slide here to show. Okay, so the next slide again. Uh, they had hobbies, uh, some of the outdoor hobbies, perhaps pressed flowers. The birds you see in this bell jar were, um, uh, uh, those are real birds. Taxidermy was a popular hobby of the time. So the children would have perhaps been you know, busy with this kind of thing. Now, before we leave this room, let us look up at the ceiling, of course. Next slide. So once again, we see uh, the stenciled ceiling. This one in a light color matching the bird's eye maple. This one with a lot of flowers in it, very floral. And also notice the little stars, little gold stars, a lot of gold here. All the rooms had a bit of gold in the ceiling, but this one has a lot of it. So again, in keeping with the temperature, the style of the room. Now let us go on with the gentleman who we'll proceed through here to the next room, which is the library. Next slide. This is the ceiling of the library. You see it once uh, immediately that is in the same style, but different. Uh, once again, floral, but much less floral, much more of the strong geometrical shapes because this is a masculine room. This is the what is known as the ebony library where there's a gentleman's room. We have the next slide. So this is the overall look. It's uh, built around a fireplace with the fireplace again with bookshelves on each side, a whole bric-a-brac. Uh, and you see that this room has been chosen as the cover for a reissue of Charles Lake Eastlake's Hints on Household Taste. This was the new Bible, the new style that people were bringing in. Uh, the, the examples that he gave in his book were used for uh, fireplaces like this all over the world, in fact. And the characteristics of the Eastlake style, as you've heard, were simplicity. Now, you might not think of simplicity, but by comparison, with the very elaborate ornamentation of the high Victorian style of earlier years, this was a simplification, the, the, the more geometrical, more simple, more craftsmanlike, if you will. So this, this was uh, again, part of the overall work of art that constitutes the ground floor of Glenview. If we have the next slide. Uh, this was known as the Ebony Library because it had books and it had this dark wood. Now on the right is a revolving bookcase, which was owned by the Trevors. On the left, one of the several bookcases in the room. Uh, again, the work of Pabst. Uh, you can't quite see it, but there's little decorations on it, which have the characteristic flower and thing. And the entire thing in the geometrical East Lake style. And in this, uh, this one, we see a lot of the Victorian bric-a-brac, some of the other bookshelves. Uh, had books in them. They, not the original books. Uh, the original books and much else was sold off at auction when the Trevors uh, were no longer occupying it, but the, the 
as part of the restoration, a whole new set of Victorian books was brought in and put in to, so that it looks appropriate. And that's perhaps not, uh, not wrong because probably the original books too were put in there for show. The, the entire ground floor, as you now understand, was designed to impress visitors, not only with the wealth of the Trevors, but also with their good taste and culture. So of course you had to have a lot of books. Uh, they might've been used, probably the children, for example, may have come down here when they were older and used the books for their school work. Now, this is called the Ebony Library, but the wood is actually ebonized wood. Uh, more of the Victorian ingenuity has been treated in such a way that it looks like ebony. Well, why not real ebony? Well, ebony is rare, so expensive. Ebony is hard to work, so more expense. Uh, th this, I remind you, was not a golden age. It was in Mark Twain's world, in Mark Twain's world, it's a gilded age. So, uh, ebony, fine, you certainly want to show your wealth, but there's no need, no reason to spend more money than you had to. So what did the gentleman talk about? The next slide, Mr. Trevor here with his friends. Uh, as you have heard, he was a Republican, a stalwart of the Republican Party. This was the Republican Party, the original Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party of anti-slavery, the party that after, uh, and uh, General Sherman, the conqueror of the South was one of the many distinguished people who ate dinner here and who sat in this room. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, the great project of the Republican Party was to preserve the vote for black people in the South. But by the time Glenn Deal was finished, that project had been abandoned. The Republican Party had become party of business, which was also appropriate for Mr. Trevor because as you have heard, he was a Wall Street man. In fact, he and his partner Colgate were known especially for trading in gold. He was not a robber baron, not known as a robber baron, Trevor. Uh, he, he and uh, Colgate, in fact, were praised for helping to stabilize the market in gold against raiders. They were regarded as socially responsible. Trevor was also a philanthropist, and one can imagine him sitting here in his room, as philanthropists will do, trying to persuade his rich friends to give some money to his causes, to the local Protestant church, Colgate University, which he founded with his partner, Colgate, people like that. And next slide. So wealth then, this, this is not an original, uh, but it is uh, very similar to one that Kerr had. So wealth then is what made possible this uh, house, but uh, Mrs. Trevor would not have said they were rich. She would have said they were comfortable. Uh, then as now there were the wealthy and then there were the super rich. The entire ground floor that we have seen would have fitted into the ballroom of one of the mansions of the really rich. But they were wealthy enough to create this work of art that we have seen, this extraordinary work of art, which is the ground floor of the Trevor House. And now to conclude, Susan will tell us a little bit about some of the more practical aspects of this remarkable house. So Susan. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, well, here we are in the billiard room. This is the final stop of our visit to Glenview. Uh, we've enjoyed some music in the parlor. We've enjoyed a delicious dinner. And now the Trevor family has invited us to conclude the evening with a game of billiards. Billiards became a popular form of entertainment among the wealthy class in the late 1800s. And homeowners who had the means, as did the Trevors, might have included a billiard, home, billiard room in their homes. Once again, the furnishings shown in this slide are, were, uh, are not the original furnishings that were uh, the Trevors had. These are all um, uh, replica uh, homes, furnishings of the period. The billiard table was that's shown in this slide is a table that was manufactured by Brunswick as the Trevors owned a billiard table that was also manufactured by Brunswick. And this one is of that period. The cue stand as well. The cue stand is rather elaborate and it is a cue stand that may have resembled one the Trevors had. The fireplace is also of the period, but again, once again, not the one, not the fireplace that the Trevors enjoyed. So uh, unlike the other rooms that we looked at today, this room has not been restored to resemble the way it appeared at the time the Trevors lived here. And it doesn't look like this. Currently the room houses an exquisite Victorian dollhouse that was gifted to the museum in 2006. Uh, we don't have a slide of the dollhouse, but we do hope that when you have the opportunity to visit Glenview in person, 
And we certainly hope that you have that opportunity someday soon that you'll take uh, that you'll visit this room and learn all about the dollhouse and the family that lives in it. Uh, next slide. We mentioned that billiards were a popular form of entertainment for wealthy families. But as this slide shows, it wasn't an activity that was enjoyed exclusively by men. Women began to take an interest in the game in the late 1800s, and women were often invited to participate in the games with the men. It was thought that including women in this activity elevated the game's credibility and stature and perhaps added a bit of decorum and civility. More innocently, I like to think that men enjoyed the company of women and recognized that billiards was an activity that they could enjoy together. Uh, we know that the Trevors were modern and progressive in their thinking, so it's easy to imagine that, young, that Emily is the young lady in this sketch. As Carolyn mentioned, Emily was active and she enjoyed sports and competition. She played golf, she skated, she cycled. So it's quite possible that uh, Emily took an interest in billiards as well. Please. Uh, in the other rooms we visited today, we discussed the decorative components of the house and the prominent designers that made their marks here. We talked about Clinton, the architects. We talked about East Lakes patterns and textiles. And of course, Daniel Pabst, the renowned cabinet maker. But none of these are shown in this room. So what features of the billiard room make it significant to, today, to today's discussion? Well, there are, there are two. The, there are practical applications that the Trevors included that were state of the art of the time, but are conveniences that today we take for granted. And you might be able to guess what these are. So here's a footprint of the first floor of the uh, home. And on the right side of the screen, you see a blow up of the kitchen and the billiard room. And if you follow the red arrow, it points to a smaller room in the southwest corner. And if you look closely, you might be able to guess what this small room is. Yes, you are correct. It is a powder room. Next slide, please. Of course, the use of indoor plumbing was in its infancy at the time Glenview was under construction and other homes like it built at this time would of course include, have included indoor plumbing. Unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of what the Glenview powder room looked like, but this slide shows some uh, Victorian era bathroom fixtures, not necessarily the ones the Trevors used, but we know that the powder room did include a commode and a sink. And here is a picture of a pull chain commode. The Trevors may have had one like this, although the bowl of, on this one is quite decorative. If you look close, you can see there's a little bit of uh, or filigree in there or some kind of a decoration. Uh, the ones on the right, the, on the, uh, the right slide show full bathrooms. Uh, the Trevors had full bathrooms on the second level of their, floor, of their home. So they would have had two bathrooms and may have had uh, some of these fixtures included in those. So all of the indoor pipes used in these rooms would have been connected to outside plumbing, which was a modern convenience that the Trevors took advantage of and of course enjoyed. Next slide, please. The other technological advancement we see on this slide, and I'm sure you can guess what these are, central heating. These are heating grates that are located on the floor and in the wall of the billiard room. We mentioned earlier that the Trevors took a lot of information away from the exposition of 1876 and not just the decorative ideas of the time, but also the latest advances in engineering and technology. It was at the exposition that they learned about plumbing and central heating. More specifically, the use of boilers to provide central heating in modern home construction. They had a high slop boiler, high slop was the manufacturer, uh, installed in their basement, and this provided heat for all the rooms in the house. So um, as was mentioned earlier, most of the fireplaces in the home were for decorative purposes only, and they relied on the central heat provided from the boiler to heat the home in the, in the cold weather months. And one final point about the heating grates, um, when we were putting together this presentation, we noted how they are quite attractive. Uh, they're much prettier than the baseboard heating that I enjoy in my home. I enjoy the heat, but they're not as, they're not as pretty as these. 
So uh, it's worth noting that the manufacturers at the time were reluctant to sacrifice beauty for practicality. They wanted their utilitarian conveniences to reflect their artisanship, and they did pay close attention to detail. So that concludes the presentation of our rooms, and I'd like to now turn it over back to Hal, who will offer us some final thoughts about Glenview, the Travers, and the Gilded Age. So now your visit with the Trevor family and their wonderful home has come to an end. My fellow docents and I hope you enjoyed your visit. It has been a great pleasure for us to be able to share our love of Glenview with you. Glenview is but one part of our museum. We hope you all will visit us in person in the not too distant future and let us share with you the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now open for any questions or comments or opinions you might have. Uh, please um, put it in the chat or raise your hand and you will be called on. Well, I, I, I just, while we're waiting for questions to come, I want to thank our docents from the bottom of my heart for this wonderful, wonderful glimpse into the lives of the Trevors in Glenview. For those of you in our audience, wonderful, wonderful audience who have visited Glenview, I hope um, you got a little more um, of an idea of what life was like at the time. And for those of you who have a visit to Glenview in the future, when it is uh, once again reopened to visitors, um, we hope this was just a, a nice um, hors d'oeuvre. Um, let's see, we have a question here. Uh, Bridget, 